So uh, hi, everyone. I'm Chuck Sanders. Um, we're going to wait just another minute or two to give people a chance to, to dial in. So uh, just, just hang on. So, so Michael, are you broadcasting from Chicago? Yeah, uh, just north of Chicago, Evanston. Okay. And, and Toby, you're in, in Europe, right? Is that? Yes, I'm close to Frankfurt. Okay, yeah. I see that the participants are trickling in. So, well, it, it should be fun. I'll tell you. I'm. A, I know we all said this by email, but I'm kind of excited to to be with this group of people. So, um, should be should be a fun session. You all are, did an amazing job getting getting all, all of us in the same room at the same time. So, yeah, well, we. Especially at this very uh, busy travel part of the year, we really appreciate all of you accommodating us on this one. So, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get ready for a short introduction here. One. That way people will at least know they're in the right place. Okay, so I think maybe we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, uh, welcome everyone and um, greetings from the Protein Society. I'm Chuck Sanders, the president of the society. And today we've got an absolutely wonderful webinar plan on engineering proteins for a green energy future. And I wanna thank Borden Lacey, my colleague here at Vanderbilt for organizing uh, this symposium. And I wanna thank the speakers uh, for, for being able to participate. We're really grateful to them. A number of them are traveling um, and and uh, it is a busy time of year. And so, um, and I wanna also say to everyone, happy Juneteenth. So if you're not from the United States, uh, today is Juneteenth, uh, which is a day that we celebrate the emancipation of the slaves back in the Civil War. And so um, I hope all of you will think a little bit about that today. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're from. So um, today's, again, this is our, our webinar for, for today. Um, this will be the last webinar for the summer, um, and um, I'm going to advance my slides here. Uh, the next webinar will actually be um, in, in September, and Jeff Kelly and David Baker have very kindly uh, offered to organize this webinar, um, and so we're looking forward to that. Um, we would love to have other people step forward who would like to organize a webinar. It's very little work, actually. Um, most of the heavy lifting is done by the society. Uh, if you have an idea for a topic, uh, please just uh, email us at the society and we'll get back to you shortly. Again, it's, it's very little work and the application process is really just a short paragraph describing what you think you'd like to do. Um, our, our annual symposium is coming up in just a few weeks in San Francisco. Uh, it has an absolutely wonderful program. This is the program committee that put it together. And um, if you still have flexible plans and you haven't decided yet what meeting to go to this summer, uh, consider coming to San Francisco to this meeting. So I wanna say just a, one last thing about uh, today's uh, webinar. Uh, and that is that yesterday in the uh, newsletter of the society under the microscope, um, the host for today's meeting, Born Lacey, uh, wrote a really nice article about what you can do in your lab to save energy. So this is not about actually doing research on, on uh, energy matters, but it's how you can make adjustments in your lab to reduce 
your lab's energy footprint. Um, and so I hope that you'll read this. If you don't get the newsletter and you would like it, uh, just send an email to our staff and we'll be happy to put you on the mailing list. Um, a really wonderful uh, article from Borden. And with that, let me just uh, again, thank everybody for attending. And I'm gonna turn it over now to our host, Borden Lacey. Thank you so much. Uh, I am thrilled to be able to um, or, uh, host this seminar today. And I appreciate uh, Chuck for giving me the opportunity. Um, I should first uh, tell you this will be the order of our speakers today. Dr. Silver going first, Dr. Irv, Dr. Savage, and then Dr. Jewett. Uh, and I want to disclose that this is not my area of expertise. The reason that I am putting this together is I would love to see us as protein scientists engage in the global effort to work toward reducing our carbon footprint. And this concept of race to zero, um, which has gained a lot of um, momentum worldwide. Uh, a lot of these ideas come from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and a report that was released in 2018 that really documented the effects that would happen on the, on the planet uh, should, should our warming increase to two degrees and the difference that would be achieved if we could limit it to 1.5 degrees. If we wanna do this, we need to reduce our carbon emissions by to zero by 2050 and by 45% by 2030. So just eight years away. So a lot of work to do. And I've been thinking a lot about what I can do to contribute to this. Um, and in looking at this, one of the things that, that Chuck mentioned is just what we can do in our labs to reduce, to reduce the, the harm, if you will. Um, laboratories are, of course, key sites of innovation, but they are also very resource intensive. And so I found a lot of resources on the web, and I do talk about them in the article that I that Chuck mentioned. Um, we can reduce the sash on our fume hoods. That saves about 40% of the energy use. Fume hoods use a tremendous amount of energy. Um, we can set our ultra low temperature freezers to minus 70 instead of minus 80. There's actually no impact on the samples and um, it reduces the energy use by 40%. It also makes your freezers last longer. Uh, if we all put our electrical equipment on timers at night, we can save a tremendous amount of energy um, collectively. And I think we can also expect more from our vendors. You know, money talks, and we may not spend a lot of money as individuals, but as scientists running research labs, we spend a lot of money. And I think we can demand more in terms of what we get from our vendors. So there are lots more ideas. This is just a couple to hopefully entice you to check out resources like My Green Labs. There are others, um, but just trying to reduce um, the impact we have as scientists. What we really need to do, though, is not just reduce, but uh, really start pulling carbon dioxide out of the air. And that is where we really need the expert opinions of uh, our speakers today. These are leaders in the field of um, trying to engineer proteins to have innovative new methods for uh, limiting our carbon emissions. And so I am just beyond <laughs> excited that I could write to these individuals and that they all said yes. I'm so grateful that they are here today. Uh, so I want to um, stop sharing and introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Pamela Silver. Uh, she is joining us from a hotel in Washington, D.C., but she is a professor and founding member of the Department of Systems Biology at Harvard Medical School. And her team has made pioneering discoveries in diverse areas of biology, nuclear transport, RNA transport and processing, gene regulation. But in recent years, she, her lab has been working on the construction of predictable genetic circuits and the, a bionic leaf that I hope she'll talk more about today, making fuel from sunlight. So, um, Dr. Silver, we look forward to hearing what you have been working on, and I turn the floor over to you. Good 
is my screen showing? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for that wonderful introduction and for putting together this fabulous group. It's great to see everybody. Um, so I'm going to be. Okay. I'm going to begin with what I think the grand challenge is that we're facing. We have this big, beautiful planet, which I think really first came into our consciousness over 50 years ago um, when it was first photographed from space. Uh, but we have this challenge facing us in that the population is going to grow. Uh, our climate issues are going to continue. And so we have to figure out how we can make a planet that can really accommodate more than 10 billion people and accommodate them in a way that is, is equitable and uh, comfortable and equitable to the planet. Now, some of the, I can't see the audience, but I know some of the younger ones in the audience in your lifetime, hopefully you will be facing the question of how do we do this on Mars? And so in, in true sort of scientific impact, what we learn from solving problems on earth will be translated in the hopefully not too distant future into how we confront new adventures like exploring space. Now, when I think about the problem of sustainability, I think about lots of things, uh, energy, how do we do that in an efficient way? Uh, how do we grow new materials? All of this in a sustainable way that is not um, contributing to the CO2 problems. How do we have food? How do we repair things? And, and for sometimes this all boils down to why can't my house repair itself, right? It's made of wood. Well, sometimes it's made of wood. And, and yet we, we should be able to have a component of sustainability that challenges us to think about not just recycling, but regrowing what we have. Now, we are also living at what I think is at the cusp of a um, industrial revolution. I've been reading a lot about the definitions of industrial revolutions, and I, I think we're at one in terms of biology. So why is that? Well, first of all, we have over 50 years of detailed understanding from molecular biology, from structural biology, a deep understanding of how a lot of biology works, not all of it by any means, but in particular when it comes to prokaryotes and in particular organisms like E. coli. And it is this deep understanding that lies at the basis for our ability to begin to rationally design systems that I like to hope will have real solutions. Other important advances include, of course, DNA sequencing, which has just been remarkable. But one that the other that underlies much of what we do is the faster and cheaper production of DNA itself, which is the substrate for building with biology. We're living through this revolution in gene precise genome ed editing, um, enhanced by the ability to do directed evolution. And this last one, which I think is super important and others will probably be discussing this, is growing all of these technologies into ability to more to faster predictably design biology by automating the design and build cycles. Underlying all of this are huge advances in data. So we have massive amounts of data, but we need better ways to look through that data, um, which is rapidly moving together with machine learning. Uh, ideally having these data, deploying computation, whether it be through sequence structure, um, really getting a desired phenotype from a desired genotype. 
and computation has an enormous role in systemizing, systematizing what has all, in many cases been a trial and error process. Now, the other thing had a lot of time to sit around and think over the past two years. And one thing I just come to terms with is the incredible, what has happened in the field of genetics and how that translates into the field of biochemistry. So when I began as a student, I think the, the most technically developed tool we used in genetics was the toothpick. Um, and now we've, um, now if you isolate a mutant, you just sequence it in bacteria. And even in higher organisms, why bother to map it? You just sequence the whole genome. So that is now common practice. I mentioned precision gene editing. In a day or two, you can generate a very specific loss of function mutation. Um, this, of course, has implications beyond genetics in, in prokaryotes, it has implications in medicine. And then one of the themes around what I'm going to talk about is this ability to go from libraries, gene libraries to phenotypes. And many times these are going to be gain of function phenotypes. I wanna also interject what I think is something that is going to hold a lot of possibilities for the future. And we're just seeing the beginning of that is the ability to synthesize entire genomes. Now, the pioneering work here was done by the Venter group who synthesized a minimal genome, which, um, and it is still to date the only synthetic genome made totally from synthetic DNA. And as, even as a basic science problem, that still remains an enigma because some 140 genes of that organism have homology up to higher cells, but we still don't know what they do. So just the act of minimizing genomes or chromosomes is going to both contribute to technology, but also to um, our understanding of how life works. And then lastly, perhaps relevant to this session is what I see as a transformation in how we do biochemistry. Traditionally, people have studied one enzyme, they've purified it from cells, et cetera. Now you can observe in genomes, in, in, in the human genome, for example, all possible enzymes of a certain class. You can synthesize those genes. I'm oversimplifying this, but make those proteins and then test them all. So why study one protein when you can make them all is the way I am now thinking about biochemistry. One of the things that underlies deployment of biology, of course, is issues around safety and containment, which the community is actively addressing. And I want to just add about synthetic genomes that by altering genetic codes, this adds a component of the ability to safely release bacteria into the environment where they will not as readily be able to undergo horizontal gene transfer. All right, so let me introduce the energy challenge, which uh, from my perspective, which is that um, as the population grows, we are going to be introducing a large number of new energy users. Uh, this of course will increase the need for energy. And one thing I wanna emphasize that I am personally passionate about is that many of these users are going to be in the developing world. And I like to think that solutions that we develop can embrace the poor of the world and and that we can develop something that is both good for the environment and uh, bringing a more equitable situation to the rest of the world. Now, as most of you know, our current energy deployment is centralized and large scale in the developed world. This is partly why we're having the, the oil price problem. And you would imagine an energy for the future would be distributed, 
available to all and ideally have low cap expenditure. Solar is, is getting is a good example of this. Which brings me to sunlight, which is our greatest natural resource, perhaps, and uh, one that I think you'll be hearing a lot more about through the day, through this sessions about how do we capture and utilize sunlight. And I will be talking about that as well. So we already have a distributed energy system that uses light and it's called a leaf. Um, the, the leaf does the water splitting reaction in response to light um, and also fixes CO2 into biomass. So this is fundamentally photosynthesis. Now, the story, I, first story I'm gonna talk about has to do with um, thinking about photosynthesis and always thinking about, can we do better than what nature does? Um, and this brought me to a collaboration with an inorganic chemist. And this, this project illustrates the integration between biology and inorganic uh, chemistry. And my colleague, Dan Nocera, uh, who is one of the best uh, inorganic chemists in the world, had developed electric catalysts that were capable of doing the water splitting reaction, producing hydrogen. But hydrogen alone, um, which was his goal, um, has certain issues. So the question is, how can you store hydrogen? How can you use it in other productive ways besides burning it directly as a fuel? And so the obvious way is to use biology, which can capture hydrogen, capture CO2, and do stuff. So to begin, Dan had invented what he called the artificial leaf, which is a silicon wafer that um, is a photovoltaic in response to light will carry out the water splitting reaction and produce hydrogen. This is really quite remarkable. You can put it in a glass of water, shine light on it and see hydrogen being produced. Our challenge was to interface this with biology. And we chose a bacteria, and I have this phenomenon of working on bacteria that keeps changing its name. So when we first worked on it, it was called Ralstonia. Now it's called C. necator. Not fair, by the way, to change the name of the bacteria. Um, so this, this bacteria is remarkable in that it can use hydrogen, fix CO2, and can be, is genetically tractable, can be engineered, to make a number of downstream products. So our challenge was to find conditions where this bacteria would compatibly grow directly in contact with the electric catalysts. This often has been difficult and why this, this has not been deployed commonly, but we fortunately were able to find conditions where the electrolysis, the electrodes were compatible and did not result in unfavorable conditions for growth of the bacteria. Now, people come to my lab and they say, oh, I wanna see the bionic leaf. And I think they think they're gonna see a leaf. It actually looks like a science experiment. It's just electrodes in a jar. Um, and as I said, the bacteria are growing through uh, fixing CO2 and the hydrogen that is produced. And then we use that to uh, engineer their metabolism to make stuff. So in the first iteration of this project, um, first of all, the bacteria themselves will make a bioplastic precursor. So we can look at the efficiency of that, which was quite high. We took advantage of prior work beautiful work by, done by Tony Sinsky, who had engineered them to make biofuel precursors. And we showed that there was efficient production of these alcohols in the bionic leaf setup. In addition, uh, we looked at the overall efficiency of CO2 into biomass. And uh, to the best of my knowledge, although we may hear something different today, uh, this is still the winner 
in terms of efficiency, it way outdoes plants, it outdoes at least wild type cyanobacteria. Um, I'm waiting for uh, some of the future talks here. Um, and it outdoes algae. Uh, so this is in terms of 10% efficiency makes it one of the best in class. So what are the features of this system uh, that make it exciting even just conceptually for the future. So first of all, it's modular. So unlike algae, this system does not have to be in direct contact with sunlight. The cells don't have to see sunlight. You can have solar panels, you can have any source of electricity um, that will run the electrocatalyst. So it's modular. The, the system itself can sit anywhere. It's versatile in terms of what it can make. And as I said, it's relatively efficient. So this brings me to a bigger concept um, that we, we are able to integrate microbes and industrial production with CO2. So this offers a route to um, remediation of CO2 release by taking that CO2 and using it in um, production facilities. So having using bacteria that use the CO2 to generate products in what is a search, essentially a circular process. So we imagine and have pursued a, a CO2 based bioproduction platform. So we could make food and materials which I will discuss a little bit, feedstock, and for example, carbon-based fertilizers. Now, as I mentioned, these bacteria are already capable of making essentially a bioplastic precursor. And these, these supposed uh, recyclable plastics you have around you, it really are not, but there are bioplastics that truly are biodegradable depending on the environment they're in and their composition. And so this does offer a biopathway towards uh, remediation. Now, I'm not gonna go into detail here. This is a, the biosynthetic pathway by which these um, PHAs are produced. I wanna make the point that there are at least two places you can intervene in this pathway using engineered proteins. One is to engineer the different types of fatty acids that are being produced. Um, and you can do that by um, capturing enzymes from other organisms or designing totally new enzymes. And you can in intervene by all, and with the enzymes that mediate the length of PHA um, intervening and altering its length. And this gives you a platform by which you can essentially tune PHAs that are made from CO2 to have different properties. And this is just one example where we made a PHA that instead of being flaky was more rubber-like. I wanna add that this has um, applications in the food arena. So the fatty acids that are produced are incredibly important for the flavor of your food. And so this also uh, offers a platform which has uh, resulted in a spin-out company for making fatty acids with new, uh, that alter the flavor of food. So let me finish this section by mentioning fertilizer, the, the production of nitrogen-based fertilizers, which brought us the revolution of the, the agricultural revolution of the last century is a big part of our problem because uh, producing fertilizer burns fossil fuels at high temperature emits CO2. So now we are thinking instead, why not use bacteria that again, fix CO2 and fix nitrogen that can be returned to the soil. So we altered the bionic leaf to grow a bacteria, a xanthobacter that has these properties of growing on hydrogen fixing CO2, fixing nitrogen. And these can be grown in the bionic leaf 
And then this is just an example from a greenhouse experiment where we can show that they can be supplemented to enhance, for example, the growth of radishes. Radishes were a favorite NASA food. Um, we are now, we've now done field trials and we can show that these bacteria essentially in a carbon neutral fashion can act as a growth enhancer. They do it by um, interfacing with the water splitting reaction, accumulating CO2 and hydrogen into these essentially energy storage granules, which then when the bacteria is introduced into the soil will fix nitrogen and produce ammonia. And this is a very efficient process. Okay, I wanna end very quickly with one concept that is slightly different, um, but well, the concept is the same, but the, the end goal is a little different. And that is our desire to transfer some of these amazing properties that cells have, like photosynthesis or carbon fixation across cell types. And again, I think you will be hearing more about this. I'm gonna give you one example that's a little quirky, but I think goes back to this issue of repair. And this has to do with using protein condensates um, to slow biological time. The inspiration comes from nature, which is most of what we do. One of the key inspires is the, this organism called a tardigrade or the water bear, depending on your age or whatever. Um, but these organisms have, especially the tardigrade, has the property that it can be freeze dried and brought back to life. And so you hear about them living on the moon and the outside of the space station and all that. But wouldn't that be a great property to be able to transfer to any cell type? And this is one of my favorites, which is called the resurrection plant. You can buy it on Amazon. It's dry. And this is a time lapse movie of what happens when you add back water. It comes back to life. Now, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to have from a sustainability point of view? If I could have freeze dried plants and put them in places that had been um, desolated by climate or whatever. Sorry. So drawing from nature, proteins are the, responsible for this phenomena. And we can look across nature and identify these proteins. They have unfortunate, confusing names. There's no unified nomenclature here, but they do have a common property in that they have regions of intrinsic disorder. So this brings uh, the models for how these may work. Uh, one idea is they form protective gels, for example, around membranes. Another is that they form protective compartments. Uh, our data has thus far supported the latter. So I wanna end with what did we do? So again, in the spirit of making lots of them and testing them, we, um, this was an incredible challenge. How do you sift through all of these proteins and um, come up with rules to figure out which ones to test? And my colleague, Debbie Marks, who is an amazing computational biologist, constructed a library of 1,000 of these. And I want to advertise that they are now all available at AdGene if you would like to test them. We developed high throughput assays so that we could iterate and the assays would reflect thing properties we might think are coupled to this sort of survival. And then our end goal was to use the, the, the information to ultimately design synthetic proteins that would confer these properties. And you can read in detail about our results here. I'm going to end with one sort of tantalizing new piece of data, which is towards our goal of being able to freeze dry mammalian cells. This has been a huge challenge. And here we have an instance where we take one of these tardigrade proteins and it can actually protect cells better from freeze drying than sort of the gold standard, which is a sugar called triolose. So we imagine this has lots and lots of applications um, and there's an enormous interest in using proteins for these applications. So let me end there and just give 
a shout out for all the amazing people, both past and present, who've worked on these two projects over the years. They've been quite challenging. And then um, lastly, by Harvard Rules, my funding and my conflicts of interest. So thank you. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, while we are waiting for questions, um, I'd like to invite any members of the panel to chime in. Um, and also, I would just like to start by asking what are some of the scientific challenges that, that you need help with <laughs> uh, for moving this forward? Well, um, uh, aside from innovation and new ideas, um, I would say that one of the biggest challenges facing this and other aspects of the bioeconomy is scale. Um, scalability, so we, we talk about these toy systems and, um, and synthetic biology has been really good at that. And, and made a lot of headway, but scalability remains the outstanding challenge at all levels, even at, at the bioproduction level. And, um, and then when you come to carbon sequestration and agriculture, I think, and I think we also need education in scaling, because again, it's fun to sit around and brainstorm and come up with uh, lab scale solutions, but translating those to the enormous scale we need to solve climate problems is something that people need to, chemical engineers are gonna be really important. <laughs> mm -hmm. Are there people that are starting to scale to start building these large bioreactors for things like the uh, Xanthobacter? We, yes, um, full disclosure, it was on my conflict of interest slide. We have, a, we have a company in that space that is doing just that and um, it's, it's going really well. <laughs> okay, awesome. I think Chuck had a question and I see a couple coming in. Yeah, I was to... just, gonna, it's just gonna ask on the bionic leaf. Um, so what's sort of the, the trade-off between electrical input and CO2 fixation? Do you, is there a ratio of some kind that you use? There is, and um, honestly, I have forgotten. It's been so long. <laughs> My short-term memory is gone. Um, but we spent, we did spend time optimizing that in the system. Um, but and I can't remember uh, whether CO two is at fixation is at the max or not. I know that it's operating at probably as good as it can get with regard to hydrogen, which is the limiting factor. Hydrogen's a problem because we're dealing with water solubility of hydrogen. So this is, so as much as I love hydrogen and I think it's still important to pursue, um, there are going to be limitations around, around that. Um, yeah, Toby, oh, sorry, Toby has his hand. Or, Maybe a quick question, Pam. Uh, so you talked about scalability. It comes in two flavors. One would be really scale in a big scale. The other would be to scale it down and to democratize uh, the technology to develop. Do you see a future of using, let's say, small scale uh, back in your own home, having such reactors? Would this be a, a, something you could imagine? Well, that's always been my dream. I, I've finally taken out my slide of, you know, how I want stuff in my house. Um, but I have a bionic leaf in my house, but it's not running. It's so that's the dream, right? Is, you know, can I have solar panels on my house that are doing everything? That's the dream, especially for the poor. Um, uh, just as an aside, I, I want to speak to a I'll come back to your, well, let me finish answering your question. So, but scale is still an issue because say you need a 300, you know, I think, you know, do you need a 300 liter fermenter in your house? Maybe that's probably not unrealistic, but that's still scale. And um, so I'm talking about go, and by the way, we, as I said, we know the bionic leaf is scalable, but the, there's sort of this key tipping point in scale going from, say around a liter 
to 300 liters. Once you get to 300, you can start making reasonable predictions about beyond that. I want to just give an illustration of a problem that, you know, things maybe you I don't think about, but in the poor, often they all, their houses are made of tin and their means their roofs are made of tin. So the heat within a living quarters is extreme. So one thing that people have approached me about is, are there biological materials or biological solutions to the roofs of houses? So these, I love thinking about these kinds of solutions. And um, so I just throw that out there because it's on my mind. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, that is great. Um, we are going to move on to stay on time, but there are a couple questions in the Q&A if you wouldn't mind answering those sure. offline. Um, I, I think oh, a lot of people will be yeah. interested in them. I will do that. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, our next speaker is Dr. Toby Herb, who is joining us from the Max Planck Institute in Terrestrial Microbiology in Marburg, Germany. His lab has made pioneering contributions to the understanding and engineering of microbial metabolism with a specific focus on building synthetic carbon dioxide fixation and photosynthesis pathways. Dr. Erb, thank you so much for joining and I turn the floor over to you. Right, thanks so much for the introduction and I'm very glad to be here online saving CO2, working against the climate change. And uh, yeah, it's my great pleasure to uh, present to you our recent efforts from our lab in which we actually engineer, re-engineer proteins, complete pathways maybe uh, to uh, create something you would call a new to nature photosynthesis. And uh, the question of course, why would we do this? Why are we actually focusing on redeveloping, reinventing photosynthesis? The point is very simple. And the, the answer to this question lies in the air surrounding us. And as you all know, this air contains CO2 or carbon dioxide. And I think we all agree that this is a very important, potent greenhouse gas. I think we also all agree that the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere has been steadily increasing over the last years, decades, actually centuries since the onset of industrial revolution. And we all experience uh, the effects of this rising CO2 concentrations. Uh, we know that climate change is for real. And so this is of course a big concern, it's a threat. And this is typically the way we look at CO2 at carbon dioxide as being, let's say a threat for ecology, for mankind, for economy, for, for society at large. And uh, in theory, you can turn this view around. You could say, well, CO2 in the atmosphere could also be something else. You can also look at it being an interesting carbon source, a building block for life on this planet. And I think we as a society, we as, as scientists, should be able to capture and convert atmospheric CO2 into interesting compounds, close uh, the carbon cycle and come to a sustainable economy. But it's a very nice idea, it's a very big vision, but of course we all know that it's not very simply possible and we all know that chemistry has no answer to this challenge. So there's no chemical process, no simple chemical catalyst uh, that would allow us to capture and convert atmospheric CO2 at very low concentrations and convert it into multiple carbon compounds. And in fact, all our chemical efforts are still outcompeted by biology that actually is able to capture and convert CO2 at a gigaton scale. Just to give you an idea, it's around 400 gigatons CO2 or 100 gigatons carbon per year that is fixed through photosynthesis. So this is a natural blueprint for a sustainable carbon cycle. However, the problem is that this natural, uh, this natural uh, blueprint is not sufficient. So we know that natural photosynthesis is not able to compensate all the anthropogenic CO2 emissions. And in fact, uh, uh, we, we experience that the CO2 in the atmosphere is still increasing. You can ask yourself, what is limiting? So why is natural CO2 fixation not better? What limits CO2 fixation? What limits photosynthesis? And it all comes down very simply to the actual enzyme in the calvin benson besson cycle, the CO2 fixation pathway of plants, the enzyme called Rubisco, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase, the CO2 fixing enzyme that basically brings CO2 into the biomass. So what is the problem with the enzyme? Well, on the hand, one hand, it's a very slow enzyme. A Rubisco, a typical Rubisco would fix only five to 10 CO2 molecules per second. And you as protein biochemists know that other enzymes can actually operate of levels thousands to 100,000 molecules per second. So the catalytic turnover rate is very, very slow. 
And the other problem is that the enzyme also makes mistakes. And in fact, Rubisco cannot only accept CO2 carbon dioxide, but it can also accept oxygen. And in fact, an average Rubisco has an error rate of approximately 20%, which means every fifth time, instead of fixing a CO2 molecule, Rubisco would fix an oxygen molecule. This would lead to a process called photorespiration. And this wastes, again, a lot of energy and limits carbon dioxide uptake in the plant. Now, as a Engineer, you could of course think of trying to improve one of these parameters, right? You could try to think of making the enzyme faster. And in fact, you can do that. You can engineer Rubisco to become faster, but then you actually increase the error rate of the enzyme. And vice versa, if you try to improve the affinity specificity for carbon dioxide compared to oxygen, uh, you can do that, but then you slow down the enzyme. So what I'm telling you is this enzyme has evolved along something which is called the Pareto optimum. You cannot touch one of the parameters, specificity, without negatively affecting the other parameter, activity. And in fact, many people have tried to improve Robisco and we always are stuck with the same problem. You cannot improve both parameters at the same time beyond a certain, a certain threshold. And this is what has inspired us now thinking about outside of the box, thinking beyond Rubisco and, and saying, what, what if we actually were able to rethink, redesign CO2 metabolism in plants or in photosynthetic organisms? What if you think about new enzymes, new pathways, new approaches to capture CO2 others than those that evolved? It's of course a bold statement, a, a bold vision, and you can ask yourself, is this possible? Can you design, invent new C2 fixation pathways? What I'm showing you here is, the so-called metabolic landscape of CO2 fixation. What I'm showing you here is basically all the different pathways that nature has evolved during the billions of years evolution. And what you see is besides Rubisco and the Calvin cycle, there are six or seven other pathways that evolved in microorganisms. So nature has actually evolved a couple of other solutions beyond those used in photosynthesis to fix carbon dioxide. So this is great, nature is creative, but if you look at it from the lens of a synthetic biologist, you could also critically say, well, nature has found a couple of solutions, but it missed out on many other potential solutions. And this is what you actually see here. These are synthetic, theoretical, hypothetical pathways we can think of that could exist in nature, but that we haven't found in nature yet. And this is what we actually would call synthetic biology. We are really interested in building these new to nature solutions. Those things we have not seen in nature. We're trying to see if they are better or actually more efficient than those that were evolved over the billions of years. And I just wanna stress and emphasize again, this is not metabolic engineering. This is not taking existing process like the Calvin cycle, like photosynthesis and trying to crank up a little bit efficiency. This is really realizing complete new solutions. If you wanna say so, it's trying to build a new operational system for photosynthesis. Well, how are we going to do this? In principle, we started with a theoretical design phase. And I think Pam gave a great introduction to what SynBio is about. SynBio is about really thinking of an optimal solution, at least a theoretical optimal solution. And then it's about finding the individual parts, enzymes, proteins you would need to build, for instance, such a new to nature C2 fixation pathway. Likely you would uh, build the system, combine those enzymes, build the pathway, and then optimize in several rounds, trying to play, replay, or mimic evolution. And then once you have a system that fixes you to efficient, you would like to implement it into a cellular setup, and this could be natural or eventually an artificial cell. I'm going to talk about both. And of course, if you talk about scalability, and Pam alluded to that already, at some point you want to go away maybe from microorganisms and even go into something like a plant at the end of the, uh, of the, uh, of the scale, where you would have effects that you could then basically scale on the global, onto a, a, a global scale. All right, so how do we design these synthetic CO2 fixation pathways? We basically use the same principles you know from chemistry. We really sit down and think about hypothetical theoretical pathways that we could think of. And for all these systems we design here, a couple of examples, catch cycle, HOPEC cycle, CHIME cycle, it's important to note that all these designs are really built in our imagination on potential metabolites and potential transformations, oxidations, CC lyase reactions, hydrogenations, and so on and so forth. So we can think about thousands of different uh, solutions in principle. Yet, of course, you need to find a way how to evaluate your own designs, right? And this is where actually thermodynamics, physics, and chemistry comes into play. So we take all these designs we think of in the, in the lab, and then we use simple criteria, for instance, like kinetics. And we think about what kind of transformations would be good, fast, and efficient. And one example is shown here, the catch cycle, which we've actually realized a couple of years ago, 
This is built on a complete new principle of CO2 fixation. This does not require Rubisco. The catch cycle requires a complete new principle of CO2 fixation, which is approximately 20 times faster than Rubisco, which means at the same time, you would be actually able to fix 20 times more CO2 molecules than if you were running classical photosynthesis. So speed matters, but of course also energy matters. Thermodynamics, the question, how much energy per CO2 fix do you have to invest? Or in other words, how much ATP, eventually also NADPH, has to go into the cycle. What you see here is that the catch cycle is first version is actually two times more ATP efficient than the Calvin cycle. In other words, it needs only half of the ATP that normal photosynthesis needs. And so you can see already by the simple design criteria, evaluation criteria, the enzyme cycle should be faster, the catch cycle, and it should require less energy than classical photosynthesis. And of course, that's a great starting point to really think about realizing this pathway in the lab. And now it comes down to protein biochemistry. It comes down to really finding the individual enzymes, the proteins you need to build the cycle and really take a brute force approach. And we try to find for each of these transformations, an enzyme that could do one or the other step and really take it from very different biological resources, methylobacteria, plant-associated bacteria, take it from Clostridia, anaerobic gram-positive bacteria, E. coli, uh, archaea from the ocean, even from human liver, Arabidopsis, so whatever we kind of get a grab on and we know that the chemistry is right, we take. Now, of course, some of the enzymes do not exist and some of the transformations cannot be made. And in this case, we actually need to re-engineer enzymes to do one or the other step. And this is shown here, so we had to force a so-called dehydrogenase into an oxidase. So we re-engineered this enzyme here in, uh, in uh, whatever this color, same in color, I don't know how to <laughs> exactly. So we had to engineer our own enzyme to build our own pathway. So long story short, we tested probably almost hundreds of enzymes to find 15 enzymes from six different organisms, one engineered enzyme, to build the first version of this cycle. What you see here is that in fact, if you put all these 15 enzymes together, you energize the system by adding ATP, NADPH, CO2, the system starts to turn, all the enzymes work together and they start to fix carbon dioxide and they convert carbon dioxide into a molecule glyoxylate, which is the output molecule of the cycle. This is fantastic because it shows you that you can really think of a complete new to nature solution. You can find or engineer the enzymes to build the solution and it's actually functional. However, what it also shows you is that the actual rates you achieve with such a system are very, very low. So the system is absolutely not optimal. And even though we thought so hard about the individual enzymes, individual catalytic steps, the final system we built at the end was not very good. So why is that? Why is our, what is, what is the flaw in our design? And the answer is very simple. We brought together many different enzymes from many different biological backgrounds. And all these enzymes don't have a common history. Right? So they are co-evolved, evolved in different biological backgrounds, which means they do not interact in a, in a good fashion with each other. So some enzymes get inhibited by certain metabolites. Other enzymes steal certain metabolites or have side reactions. What you now need to do is to harmonize and synchronize the system, debug the system, trying to optimize, for instance, some of the enzymes. And this is what we did. We had to redesign some enzyme active sites to suppress certain side reactions, which were deleterious for the whole system. We had to think about going and circumventing certain reactions, going the same topology, but using different enzyme biochemistry. And then we had to add even some enzymes that are simply there to recycle certain metabolites that drop off the cycle, scavenging enzymes. So we make the system more complex, but also more robust. And over this course of these optimization steps, which are all done in rational fashion, you see that we improved the system from version one to version 5.4 by almost a factor of 20, and again, we didn't change anything in terms of the topology or the individual metabolites. It's simply trying to engineer enzymes, replace certain enzymes and or adding more enzymes to the cycle and you improve already by a factor of 20. Now that's fantastic. And we actually approach rates that you can have and will have if you, for instance, break a plant leaf and you try to measure C2 fixation in an extract of a plant. Yet, of course, this is all done in a very complicated fashion, you need to think, you need to identify the steps that are kind of uh, bottlenecking the whole system. And LD would have an, another setup, a systematic way to optimize this very complex biocatalytic cascade. 
And what we've been doing lately is using actually lab automation combined with machine learning to systematically screen for optimized conditions, which means to systematically vary enzyme concentration, metabolite concentrations, also the cofactors pHs. And we have basically used a design build test cycle, which involved a uh, so-called uh, uh, contact-free uh, uh, dispensing robot where you can scale down the catch cycle in let's say 10 microliter scale. You can, uh, you can, you can run it in, a, in 384 well plates. You analyze the product uh, ratio, the product yield. And then you use the data to feed an active learning algorithms and you predict a new set of experiments. And so we do this over several rounds, let's say eight or 10 rounds of experiments. It's around a thousand different conditions we have screened and tested. It's a total of more than 100,000 pipetting steps. You actually see that the machine learning algorithm picks up and optimizes the system. What you see here is that within eight days or eight rounds of experiments, we actually achieve to improve the system by a factor of 10, which I find very impressive. And again, like this is using simply the power of lab automation. I think um, Mike will speak about that and about machine learning. And also this is what, what, what Pam said. So making use and sense out of the large amount of data you create. All right. So of course we just built a synthetic CO2 fixation cycle in a test tube. The question is, can we energize the system with light? So can we build something like an artificial chloroplast? Can we go one step further and try for instance, to hook up our synthetic CO2 fixation cycle with a natural photosynthetic machinery. Let's take spinach chloroplasts, which convert light into ATP and NTPH, and ask simply, does this natural system work with our synthetic cycle? And the answer is, of course, no, it does not work, because again, there's interactions between the two systems, the synthetic cycle and the natural photosynthetic machinery. You need to dig down and identify the bottlenecks. You need to replace a couple of proteins, in this case, an oxidase by dehydrogenase, and another oxidase through carboxylase. And then you can actually operate the catch cycle with thylakoid extracts. We can go a step further. You can ask about, can we also now confine everything in time and space? Can we build something like a minimal cell, a small cell using microfluidics encapsulate the thylakoids as well as the enzymes? And can you now shine light on these small droplets that mimic a little bit the chloroplast? Can we energize those systems with light? And can they use the energy to fix carbon dioxide? And yes, this is possible. So in a nutshell, what we have really achieved is now building from the bottom up something that mimics this, uh, the, the function of a chloroplast and it's confined to a cell size compartment. Well, now we come again to scale. And uh, to be honest, what Pam has said is these small droplets are very fragile. They fall apart, but I think it's the first way towards building such systems. And it might be just the optimization function of kind of getting them being more robust and sustained for a longer time. This is probably up for, uh, up for the next 10 and 10 years in our lab to, to build more robust uh, droplet systems. But of course you could also think now going the other direction saying scale could also be achieved if you try to implement this catch cycle now back into a living organism. Is it possible and how would you do that? In other words, let's take this new let's say, uh, let's say software, this new operation system and try to put it back into an old hardware, something like E. coli, for instance. So how do we do that? Well, in principle, we make E. coli addicted on the C2 fixation pathway. So what we do and what we've done recently is we basically have isolated an essential compound of E. coli, succinylcoa and central metabolite in the citric acid cycle from all the central metabolism of E. coli. So E. coli has no way to synthesize this compound anymore. We've taken away the capability of E. coli to make succinyl-CoA. And you see here, if you don't provide succinyl-CoA, the organism simply stops growing. Now, what you can do is bring back all the 15 enzymes, or in this case, 13 enzymes of the catch cycle, and you feed crotonate, the intermediate of the catch cycle. And if all these enzymes express successful E. coli, E. coli can use now the catch cycle to produce succinyl-CoA, and it could start growing again. And in fact, this is what you see. So you bring in almost the whole catch cycle and E. coli uses CO2 to make succinyl-CoA from crotonate and it starts growing again. And that's the first step of implementing now the catch cycle, the full catch cycle in E. coli and then hopefully leveraging natural evolution to further improve the system. So what I'm saying here is after having learned and built a system in vitro, moving it in vivo is possible 
but of course it requires a lot of a lot of a uh, lot of redesign of metabolic networks all right this is at the moment still of course not saving the world from global change and hard to imagine how you can scale this up within the next five years but i think we are on the way to learn how to build more complex systems from the bottom up and i think at the moment we're at the stage of tool of getting inside how to build such systems and that's also the model of the max planck society inside mass precede application yet of course the last five minutes i want to show you something what we've learned already by doing this very complex metabolic designs something we can apply already today to, um, to build solutions that might be applicable in one or two years. And for that, I wanna come back to the actual problem of, uh, of photorespiration. So the first part of the talk, I talked about getting completely rid of Rubisco, trying to build a new engine, a new operational system for photosynthesis and a synthetic pathway. But you could also accept that Rubisco makes mistakes. You could accept that photorespiration exists and you could say, well, why not improving photorespiration itself? If you achieve that, you might actually not boost up photosynthesis by a factor of 10, but you might boost photosynthesis by a factor of 20. And this would be very often or very likely already sufficient to compensate human, human, human activities. So how do you do that? And what's the problem uh, with photorespiration? So this is basically what happens during CO2 fixation, the Calvin cycle, Rubisco goes in rounds and rounds, fixes carbon dioxide, but from time to time it fixes oxygen. And then it produces a compound called 2-phosphoglycolate. And this compound is toxic to the cell and is recycled, scavenged in a very complex photorespiration pathway. This requires energy. This is many enzymes, many enzymatic steps. It's up to 10, 11 different steps over many compartments in the cell, mitochondria, chloroplast, peroxisomes. It releases ammonia and it releases carbon dioxide. So if you look at it from the perspective of synthetic vultures, you would say photorespiration is a completely flawed process. It's ill-designed. And now you can take again the same logic I introduced to before, and you can say, how would an ideal photorespiration pathway look like? Ideal pathway would not release CO2. It might even fix carbon dioxide. It might be short. It should have no crosstalk with other pathways, and it should be ATP and NTPH efficient. So together with Aaron Bar Evan, we have thought about how such a pathway could look like. Let's take phosphoglycolate, which is converted to glycolate in the cell. This is the starting point for new to nature photorespiration. Let's activate glycolate into glycolyl CoA, a new to nature CoA ester. Let's take this glycolyl CoA and add a CO2 to it. Let's fix carbon dioxide instead of releasing it. You make tartaryl CoA, that's also a new to nature compound. And then let's reduce tartan create to two steps, first into the semi-aldehyde and then into the glycerate, which you can activate and you're back in the Kelvin cycle. What I'm showing you here is you just need four steps instead of 11 steps. You do not release CO2, you fix CO2, and you don't waste a lot of energy, ATP and NTPH. And in fact, you can also quantify that. You actually see there's, instead of 11 steps, only five steps you require. The last step is the activation of glycerate into phosphoglycerate. You see here in the scale of reducing equivalence versus ATP, the so-called TACO pathway, tartaryl pathway, named after the central metabolite, tartaryl A, is way down here compared to natural photorespiration. It requires much less ATP and much less reducing equivalence. And of course, the challenge is here, it doesn't exist in nature, okay? For none of the enzymes, for none of the metabolites, there is any enzyme known that could, uh, could, uh, could ex uh, that existed so far. So the challenge was we had a really good design, but we had no enzymes and no proteins to build the system. And so we went on to a, into a fact finding or enzyme finding mission to find those synthetase, to find those reductases, and most notably to engineer or find this carboxylase. And key is really this new CO2 fixing step, which we engineered in the backbone of existing carboxylase. So we realized glycolytic CoA carboxylase by taking the existing propionyl carboxylase and trying to engineer the active site to accept the new substrate. And we did a combined, uh, combined approach of, on the one hand, rational design, making the, uh, making the active site a bit more hydrophilic, pushing the, the, the hydroxy group of glycolytic CoA a bit more in one certain direction, establishing an, a, 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 a hydrogen bonding network and slowly establishing the activity in two and three 
uh, different uh, rounds of, of rational design. And after this first activity was established, we then used high throughput screening, screening 6,000, 7,000, 8,000 different mutants to further improve the activity from basically a non-existing carboxylation activity into a carboxylation activity, which is around six CO2 molecules per second, which is around the activity a typical biotin dependent carboxylase would show. So we really started from a very lousy wild type activity and engineered an almost natural like uh, real existing carboxylase version M5. So we demonstrated that it's possible to build this uh, new to nature carboxylase. We reconstitute the whole pathway and showed that in fact in vitro, the pathway designed, including this carboxylase increases photosynthetic yield by 40%. And we even brought in this pathway into an Arabidopsis mutant, which shows a lot of photorespiration stress. And under very stressful conditions, we actually see a beneficial phenotype. I'm not saying that this is uh, already a pathway that, uh, that, uh, that uh, gives Arabidopsis an advantage under normal conditions. But if you really increase photorespiration, you see a positive phenotype. And I think now it's up again for us to, uh, to understand what's happening here, to further improve the system, adjust uh, CO2 fixation, the uh, enzyme levels, and understand more the interaction of this synthetic pathway within the context of the native, uh, of the native uh, plant or uh, metabolism. All right. So with this exciting data, I hope I can conclude in time. Uh, I hope I could convince you that synthetic biology offers new options. And we can really think about new designs and we need protein biochemists, biochemists that find the parts, the enzymes or engineer the enzymes to build the system. We can use lab automation, big data to improve such systems. And then at the final, uh, at the, the, the final step, we can actually already implement certain parts already successfully in living organisms. And of course the dream would be to realize and scale all this up and really see if these new designs uh, are functional and even better than natural photosynthesis in the future. This is up for another presentation, maybe in 10 years, maybe never, I'm not sure, but at least if you don't try, you don't know. Finish up here with a great lab uh, back in uh, Marburg, Germany and a lot of support by the Max Planck Society. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. And uh, I hope for a couple of questions. Thank you so much. Um, that was a really inspiring talk and I'm so glad you shared as much as you did. We are running um, short on time. There are some questions, so I'm going to let you answer those um, in the Q&A if you don't mind typing them in. And we'll keep moving to our next speaker, Dr. David Savage. Uh, Dr. Savage performed a really pioneering postdoctoral fellowship in the lab of Pam Silver, where he began the work on photosynthetic cyanobacteria. And he has moved this on into his independent uh, lab. And he is now associate professor of biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at the University of California at Berkeley. So, uh, Dr. Savage, thank you so much, and we look forward to your talk. Great. Thank, thank you, Borden. Can you all see my slides okay? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so, so I'll tell you about our work um, uh, on a sort of a related system today, a, a natural system found in bacteria that I started actually uh, work on in uh, Pam's lab, and, uh, and I'll highlight some of that, and then um, in the last decade or so uh, within my own group, I've been trying to develop a deep biological understanding uh, of it, uh, of how it works uh, in such a way that perhaps one day we can apply it and plant it. Uh, and I thank both Pam and Toby for doing uh, some wonderful introductions uh, so that I can uh, sort of uh, hopefully uh, catch us back up uh, on time. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it, I, I would just highlight that uh, basically roughly uh, 1 billion years or so ago, primordial cyanobacterium was engulfed by a eukaryote, for those who, who, don't, who don't know the sort of the biology behind this. This ultimately gave rise to the chloroplast and the green lineage of the land plants all around us. And of course, this is hugely important because this gives us the scale of agriculture, provides the foundation of the food chain, uh, led to all fossil fuel energy sources and is, and is the dominant, of course, flux removing CO2 from the atmosphere, as, as Toby so nicely showed. But uh, as he highlighted, it, it, also, um, it also presents a problem because this really forever linked plant carbon fixation with Rubisco, this sort of poor enzyme. And I think that's it's debatable. It'd be fun to, if this was in person, we could all have a conversation at, at the bar about the sort of the eccentricities of, of Rubisco. 
but Rubisco as this sort of central player um, in, in the Calvin cycle has, has led to some issues because it's somewhat of a poor catalyst. It's supposed slow for the on-target carboxylation and it makes mistakes, it can fix oxygen. Uh, and this ultimately, as we, as we just heard, results in a loss of carbon from metabolism and limits photosynthetic efficiency in, in most plants. Uh, and again, um, just, just highlighting again, the importance of this from what we just heard, that it's thought that if we could somehow improve uh, this, this overall process, that photosynthetic yields could be, in, uh, could be improved um, uh, to on the order of 50% or, or more. Uh, this would be, of course, very important for uh, CO2 removal technology to improve grain yields, and perhaps reduce land usage across the scale of, of agriculture on the planet. But again, as we just heard, most of these improvements actually to Rubisco um, uh, or uh, Rubisco itself has proven recalcitrant to improvements. There's, there's decades of beautiful enzymology and efforts and sort of heroic efforts to put these changes into plants. Uh, and there's very limited success to, to show for them. Some glimmers perhaps, but it, it's been very, very difficult. And so thus um, many people are looking for alternatives uh, and um, one of the things that has inspired me, I'm sort of a lesson learned from Pam, is to, uh, is to be inspired by what you see uh, around nature. So across nature, one way that we see Rubisco being improved is to still use the sort of the normal reductive pentose phosphate pathway or Calvin benson basham cycle, uh, but to, even though you're going to use Rubisco, add additional functionalities on top of it. Uh, and these are called one way to do this are called CO2 concentrating mechanisms, a way of improving carbon fixation. And this is a term I'll use the, throughout the talk, CCM. Uh, and as the name implies, CCMs literally increase the local concentration around Fisco to promote rapid on-target uh, catalysis. So we see diverse CCMs present in all sorts of photosynthetic organisms. There are so-called carboxysomes, something I'll talk more about in a second. Uh, which are found in a variety of different kinds of bacteria, uh, probably perhaps most famously cyanobacteria. There's also the pyrenoids of, of algae uh, and the Kranz anatomy found in some plants. Uh, however, one, one of the oddities about this is that for, uh, for, for whatever reason, unfortunately, these CCMs are um, uh, largely lacking in the C3 plants uh, that are generally our crops, except for a handful of things such as maize. Uh, and so uh, it's thought that perhaps the principles and perhaps even some of the components could be ported into these C3 crops to endow them with these CCM-like activities uh, to improve photosynthesis and again, reduce um, uh, uh, photorespiration. And so we've hypothesized, and one system that we've worked on uh, is that the alpha carboxysome CCM, a very specific type of CCM found in uh, certain bacteria, I'll tell you more about it in a second, uh, which actually in its own right contributes uh, uh, um, uh, on the order of 10% or so to the, the global carbon cycle fixation. Uh, we believe that this system is highly tractable and is a sort of unique system to, to consider whether it might be suited to this task of, of C3 crop uh, engineering. And so what is the bacterial CCM? Well, uh, work from us and others uh, combining genetics, biochemistry, modeling over many, many decades uh, has sort of revealed uh, uh, the CCM uh, as a physiological strategy which has two important activities. The first is the use of inorganic carbon pumping to increase the cytosolic concentration of bicarbonate. And second, it, 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 it uses a protein-based organelle known as the carboxysome, which encapsulates Rubisco uh, and a carbonic anhydrase enzyme and there locally converts bicarbonate levels in an equilibrium process to high levels uh, of CO2 to promote that on-target Rubisco activity. So um, this is work that had been continuing on uh, for you know, several decades. And prior to our work, there were several um, unanswered questions, uh, uh, including how does the carboxysome assemble and function? Does this simplistic view that I, I showed you here capture all the essential activities? Perhaps there might be missing components. Uh, and uh, if this model is true, it suggests that we might be able to port the CCM from one organism uh, into another. So we set out to address these questions, um, actually both as when I was finishing as a postdoc in Pam's lab, and then again, as I, once I started my own lab at Berkeley. So today I'll tell you about two uh, quick vignettes. First, how we've been defining the biochemical assembly pathway of carboxysomes, which has been a fun sort of biophysical exploration for us. 
And secondly, um, how we've started to use this information to reconstitute the CCM uh, in a new host. Okay, so first off, I, I said this term, which is it's fun that I'm talking uh, here to by a chemist, because uh, I use the term protein organelle, which sort of sounds weird. Uh, and I showed you the pathway here, um, which you know suggests it's acting like an organelle. And, and that indeed, to, indeed is true from the studies of modeling and others that have shown it sort of acts like an organelle in which the interior chemistry is out of thermodynamic equilibrium with the rest of the cell. But perhaps amazingly, what we know about the carboxysome is that it's a, a massive protein structure with a, elaborate um, uh, ultrastructural organization. So we know that actually from the work of uh, uh, Todd Yates, Cheryl Kerfeld, Grant Jensen, and, and many others, that the carboxysome is actually a protein shell formed from hexamers and pentamers, along with enzymes, rubisco and carbonic anhydrase and some other accessory factors, which are loaded inside the luminal structure. And so previous work has given us great structural insights into the individual components, but we've had less of an understanding of how the entire uh, particle comes together to form these structures. Uh, and uh, my group first started out trying to understand that assembly process uh, better. So our first major result uh, was to identify the proteins sufficient to build the carboxysome. So inspired by um, previous work from Jessup Shively and colleagues, who were the first to biochemically identify and characterize the carboxysome. When I was a postdoc in the Silver Lab, we set out to understand how this you know, amazing 300 megadalton um, uh, uh, molecular machine self-assembles in the context of the cytosol. So it's an it's a, it's amazingly complex system. And it's 10,000 total subunits. Again, uh, it's a, roughly 100 times the size of a ribosome. Uh, and yet it's all protein encoded. Uh, and, uh, and in 2012, uh, we determined that the 10 genes shown here when taken from halothiobacillus and expressed in E. coli are sufficient to build stru structurally, um, uh, uh, structurally real, uh, reasonable, morphologically uh, similar carboxysomes to the native host. So it told us that there's 10 proteins uh, that are sufficient to do this. Uh, and whatever host factors might be needed are found both in E. coli and the native organism. Uh, and it sort of also told us that these 10 proteins and their uh, physical interactions are somehow a, a sufficient uh, to reconstitute this major uh, portion uh, of this TCM. And so we use this as a, as a sort of a test bed for exploring the biochemistry uh, somewhat further uh, and showed, uh, along with Cheryl Kerfeld's lab, that one of these proteins, uh, CSOS2, is particularly interesting because it's an intrinsically disordered protein that helps mediate the self-assembly of the entire uh, complex, which was actually in sort of an early, um, uh, an early observation of intrinsically disordered proteins organizing the, the prokaryotic uh, cell. We've since gone on to show that CSOS2 is the interaction hub of the carboxysome, where it's, wherein it's in terminus, actually binds rubisco and helps bring rubisco into the carboxysome. Whereas the C terminus actually binds the shell uh, and, uh, and itself uh, and helps, um, uh, again, uh, nucleate the, the overall assembly uh, of the system. Uh, perhaps uh, most interestingly, we've shown that also you can reconstitute CSOS2 and Rubisco alone. And when you do so, you form these condensates that uh, are highly reminiscent of the luminal cargo shown here in TEM, which is, uh, we know is critical for assembly. And then using this information, we've also been able to sort of detail the molecular determinants of this process by um, essentially developing a trapped assembly intermediate, which we're able to solve its structure uh, using crystallography and, and define, again, the, the side down to the sort of the amino acid side chains, which create this specific interaction. And somewhat, uh, uh, you know, very satisfyingly in an amazing demonstration of convergent evolution, I mentioned there are other CCs, there are actually beta carboxysomes and uh, algal pyrenoids, which are entirely different um, from an evolutionary perspective, you know, different classes of proteins and whatnot, but still use rubisco. But it turns out these other systems, which also rely on organized rubisco, all contain cognate disordered proteins, uh, which suggest a sort of a generality uh, to the system. This was shown by Martin Jonicus and, and Manaji Higher Hartle and their respective works. Uh, and uh, shows that there are hints that there might even be additional rubisco interactors yet to find in other systems. Uh, so we're uh, very excited about that sort of thinking and, and looking for those type of systems. We're now working uh, on developing a total biochemical understanding of, of the uh, carboxysome assembly process 
So we have the protein components identified, we're uh, purifying them or, or have purified them in, in various fragments and whatnot, and are testing the uh, various hypotheses that we have about how an initial sort of seed carboxysome is formed and how you move from a sort of an initial reversible um, shell nucleation process uh, in which you undergo ultimately a phase transition into a cargo accretion process to drive the assembly of these commission carboxysomes in vivo. So it's a fun sort of structural biology and biophysical um, uh, problem uh, that we're working on in terms of in vitro reconstitution. For the last uh, 10 minutes or so, I want to return to this, uh, this topic of can the CCM be concentrated and be concentrated in vivo? Uh, so uh, in 2016, uh, uh, working uh, with Neil Mangan uh, at Northwestern, uh, we published a reaction diffusion model of this bacterial CCM, which, which suggested that a reconstitution in simpler hosts, such as E. coli, might be possible. But this actually raised some sort of mechanistic uh, problems for us, which is that actually at the time uh, in the natural halothiobacillus system, we didn't even know what this uh, carbon transporter, which I mentioned is the other half of the important system, we didn't even know the molecular identity of that molecule. Uh, and this suggested that you know, we're missing some components, so an in vivo reconstitution would be difficult. Uh, and there might even be unappreciated activities that we don't even know about, uh, and we might want to see if, if those exist. Uh, so to answer this question about what other factors we might be missing, uh, we turned to back to the natural system, Halothiobacillus, and carried out uh, a systematic screen to uh, sort of map all potential CCM components using barcoded transposon uh, with sequencing uh, mutagenesis. Uh, so briefly, uh, we carried out a screen in Halothiobacillus using these transposon knockouts uh, to look for mutants uh, that might have a defect under the conditions of ambient CO2, which is actually relatively low CO2 concentrations, about 0.04%, uh, relative to a high CO2 uh, condition. That is mutants, which really what they do is fail to concentrate uh, carbon. Uh, so we carried out this screen practically by growing a mutant library that we developed, splitting the culture into these two conditions, run it through a series of um, growth uh, uh, conditions, and then you use uh, deep sequencing or short read sequencing to count the mutants uh, in these different conditions relative to a starting point. And you basically look at the fold change or the fold enrichment change and look for things which are dropping out. And here is the fitness uh, of that plot in which, are, again, we are able to identify these unknown components. Um, so uh, the plot is you know, basically ambient condition fitness versus high CO2. And immediately what you can see is the genes down here on the bottom um, have low fitness in ambient conditions. Uh, that is, and it turns out, many of them are genes for the carboxysome. These sort of serve as, as positive, positive controls for the system. Uh, these data also indicated that about uh, the entire CCM could be encoded by as few as 25 genes spread across three operons. And they identified, uh, interestingly, a, a membrane, a potential membrane protein, which we keyed in on because we thought it might be um, this uh, sort of missing transporter. Uh, and specifically, so the screen showed two genes of interest, a large protein categorized as domain of unknown function and a separate protein which had homology to the cation transport channel of complex one. And for reasons you'll see in the next slide, we've renamed these genes DAB-A and DAB-B for DABs accumulate bicarbonate because they function uh, ultimately as a, as, a, as a carbon pump. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say that these genes were also picked up in a separate proteomics based screen by Kathleen Scott, uh, in parallel, and her work, along with our work, sort of uh, helped us get uh, to this model. So again, most interestingly, we've, we've seen that expression of the DAB complex leads to energy coupled by carbonate uptake. This is now in E. coli. Uh, and so using a C14 assay, we've shown that we can get large uptake of bicarbonate when we express, and it requires both DAB-A and DAB-B to be expressed, uh, and that this can be disrupted using an uncoupling agent shown here. Uh, left of that, suggesting again, it's an energy driven system. We've also shown that the DAB A protein in particular seems to have a, a, a cryptic carbonic anhydrase like active site. I'll skip over some of the details, but we sh we've shown using X ray fluorescence that it binds zinc in purified form, leading us to the model uh, that the DAB complex is a new form of, uh, of energized carbonic anhydrase, uh, which is perhaps driven by a cation gradient. 
that leads to accumulation uh, of, uh, again, ultimately of bicarbonate, the other sort of missing half of the carboxyzone. So with this data in hand, we then set out to reconstitute the whole system in vivo. And um, uh, similar actually to, to what Toby described, uh, we developed a carboxylation dependent E. coli. It's a sort of a similar oxytrophic type strategy. Uh, and so working with Ron Malo at the Weitzman, uh, we developed a strain, an E. coli strain that has a lesion in five carbon metabolism that is essentially rubisco dependent. So it requires rubisco carboxylation to grow. Um, of course, E. coli doesn't naturally have a CCM, so it requires high CO2 to grow. It doesn't grow if you grow it under ambient conditions, but then this represents a really nice chassis to try to install the rest of the CCM components uh, into. So uh, Avi Flamhol, a graduate student in the lab, uh, developed an expression system to build these 20 genes discovered in the T and Seq system, uh, where we would co-express them from two plasmids. Turns out the system didn't grow well at the beginning, but with a little bit of laboratory evolution, playing some, some various tricks with sugars and selective conditions, we were able to find plasmid mutants that enabled uh, robust growth. And it turns out um, we had sort of um, uh, had an um, unoptimized uh, um, uh, CCM expression because we're again trying to express 20 genes at once, but we pick up uh, sort of unique regulatory mutants in the plasmids. Uh, that uh, streamline the expression. And with this in hand, we can get very robust growth in CO2, uh, uh, ro ro in a CO2 dependent fashion and actually at ambient conditions. So this is now, if you just have rubisco alone in these specialized E. coli, you won't get any growth. It normally require high CO2, but if you add in the 20 genes of the CCM, we get very robust growth in air in a variety of different formats. And we can use uh, C13 uh, uh, labeling to confirm that we're getting a flux uh, into, um, uh, into E. coli's metabolism through this carbon fixation. It's actually just you know, one of the six carbons in effect and it's half of those. So we don't get, um, uh, you know, we're not getting 100% labeling. It's important to note that the energy driving this is coming from a different system, uh, but this enables E. coli to productively fix CO2 from air which is really cool because it's the first demonstration of a, of a, of a CCM like this being ported from one organism to another and sets the groundwork for identifying the components and again, some of these principles for movement uh, into a plant. So with that, uh, I will just end uh, and um, remind you if you haven't heard of these uh, things that carboxysomes are very unique protein-based organelles that facilitate uh, uh, bacterial CO2 uh, concentration uh, mechanisms. Uh, one of the things that we identified using a screen was a novel class of carbon transporter that appears to be coupled to the proton motor force and we're doing some mechanistic biochemistry to, um, uh, to uh, nail down the details on that at the moment. And finally, we've shown that you can reconstitute or port this entire mechanism composed of about 20 genes from its native organism into E. coli, which sets the stage for um, improving uh, carbon fixation uh, in, in higher organisms. Uh, so with that, I would uh, end uh, noting uh, a lot of this work was started when I was a graduate student or a postdoc with Pam and thank her uh, for her support over the years. Uh, I note our collaborator Ron Malo has been essential for all of this work uh, in the past and highlight Luke and Cece, um, uh, two postdocs in the lab who um, were important for the first half and uh, Avi, Jack and Eli who contributed to the second half of the talk and the DOE who is um, at the US Department of Energy who's been a longtime supporter of the work. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. That was an amazing talk. Um, I am curious how you think about organisms. If you were to be thinking toward moving this into, you know, an application, how you think about the organisms to pick? I'm sure E. coli is a great place to start, but are there other organisms that you would Think would be good targets for reconstituting these carboxysomes in. Yeah, yeah. There's there's certain microbes which might be of interest, and then of course plants would be um, one of the one of the main targets. Uh, I would say on the microbial side, you know, there are certain natural chemoautotrophs, um, which like for example Ralstonia that, that Pam mentioned, in which certain kinds of applications could could be useful to improve uh, 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 CO2 assimilation. That requires a little bit of effort because they have their own natural systems. And one of the things that actually matters for the CCM is ensuring that you don't have a, a carbonic anhydrase anywhere else activity in the cell. It's only inside the carboxysome. 
So you have to, you have to sort of clean up the metabolism before you um, inserted these systems into it. Perhaps the most interesting uh, aspect would be in Planta though. And um, actually Maureen Hansen at Cornell uh, and um, Murray Badger and Dean Price in Australia at ANU have both started to um, uh, work towards this. And they've shown uh, somewhat very compellingly that aspects of the carboxysome can be expressed in the chloroplast. You can get some of the sort of the amazing self-assembly aspects of the system, uh, but there has been troubles uh, so far in terms of getting transporters to express in the chloroplast. There's a lot of still unknown physiological mechanisms within the chloroplast about the whole scope of transporters and gradients and whatnot, which, um, you know, which speaks to what Toby said, which is we need a lot of great mechanistic, you know, basic science to, to figure out these things if we're trying to going to do ambitious engineering too. Awesome. Thank you for, for pointing that out. Any questions, comments from members of the panel? Um, we also have a question in the question and answer. Um, I wonder if there is potentially a point at which a far more effective carbon fixation system could oversaturate something in a microbial or plant metabolism, in which case, what are some, so, some of the solutions that have explored for that? Yeah, I think, I think one of the things, uh, take a stab at it, if anyone else has thoughts, feel free to jump into. I think one of the things, again, it's more of a basic science thing that we don't, um, you know, re require further study, say in the case of Rubisco, uh, is that of course, you know, carbon at the elemental level, we know that, you know, carbon is important, but actually so is, you know, NPK, we think fertilizers and nitrogen is of course very important. And some people think, you know, that Rubisco is important as a nitrogen store for plants as well. And so they're, as we get into these engineering challenges, there, there might be unintended things that we're doing to plant physiology that um, will, will uh, sort of require a lot of optimization. And although agriculture and plants in general has the advantage of scale, uh, it has the severe disadvantage of being extremely slow, right? So like design build test cycles in, if we're talking about plants in terms of screening and, and actually you oftentimes in a plant have to go to, through multiple generations to make sure that what you're observing is really um, uh, uh, there's fidelity in that process. So you go to the second generation. Those experiments can be harder than transgenic mice experiments. They can go out to a year to two years to really uh, be confident in the data. And uh, I think we need to think about faster design build test cycles for, uh, you know, for plant work as well. Um, I do need to move forward, but Toby, if you had a quick question, I'd love for you to talk about Sorry, fantastic talk, Dave. Uh, is there an optimal size of carboxysome? In principle, it's determined by the size of a, of, a, of, a, of a cyanobacterium. But now if you think about the chloroplast or a eukaryotic cell, you can increase, right? Do you, is, yeah. do you model this? Yeah, that's a beautiful, it, it ends up being a beautiful result actually from Martin Jonicus at Princeton has been working on the pyranoid and sort of size scaling as well. Uh, because the pyranoid is actually much larger. Of course, the chloroplast is much larger. The chloroplast is like the size of a bacterial cell given its evolution. Um, and, you know, we think there are reaction diffusion trade-offs in that. Uh, and um, uh, that, is a, that is a question, I think, to be explored, um, you know, more greatly. But one thing that's interesting is that if you're really small, you need an impermeable membrane. So if you're small, like a carboxysome, and the membrane of a carboxysome is a protein membrane, it's the protein shell around it. As you grow larger, um, uh, the diffusion slows down, right? Because it takes a much longer, it goes as the square to diffuse away, which is what you're trying to ensure that you don't lose CO2 from the process. And so you don't need the same kind of membranes over large size scales. So maybe it actually in some ways, you know, there are co components of the carboxysome that could be jettisoned as you get into a chloroplast with, at larger size scaling. Uh, but that's, you know, to be determined and optimized and whatnot. Okay, thank you so much. Great. Thanks, our final speaker for today is Dr. Michael Jewett, who is the Walter P. Murphy Professor of Chemical and Biological Engineering.